while working in the trauma unit and there was a patient who was covered in swastikas and he would refuse to speak to me um, whereas he would speak to all the white um, doctors and nurses and when did he, I did he say so did he say I refuse to speak to that doctor no he just wouldn't um, when I was asking him questions or you know trying to provide the care that he needed um, and then I think the most things that stood out to me was um, I was sharing this with um, one of my white colleagues yeah. and he's like oh uh, maybe he's having a bad day you know he's a nice guy but maybe he's having a bad day and for me that was kind of worse than um, and he was covered in swastika tattoos yes. that's exactly. a lot of bad days isn't it that's they take a, a while yeah Good grief. so then since then basically i lost confidence in even sharing um these incidents which there's many of and you face them not only from patients but also from you know your fellow colleagues which is very um disappointing and you just feel that you um, you just have to keep it to yourself, basically, and carry on. Do, do you think they don't notice? or that they, 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 I mean, I'm not making excuses for them, but they, they don't want to notice. I think it's more a case of it makes them uncomfortable to discuss these issues. Yes. So um, they um, kind of try to, in the kind of process of making themselves comfortable, they make you even more uncomfortable. Yeah, of I think course. that's probably what's going on. Are you still a doctor? Uh, yes, I am. But currently doing a PhD, so I work part time. Um, what happens when a doctor gets a PhD? Do you become doctor, doctor? <laughs> you do become doctor, doctor, but you don't get paid anymore. So <laughs> you're still a doctor, and, and, and you're just a doctor who's underpaid. Well, of course. I, I, let's hope that gets redressed soon. And, and finally, you, you know, you've mentioned one of the standout examples of what you've experienced. Would you experience microaggressions or aggressions on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? I'm sorry to be simplistic, but just ballpark frequency question. I would say on a daily basis. Oh, really? Um, yeah, and just also, just quickly, like um, having, you know, as much as I would like to treat all my patients equally, but I found myself having to advocate for sort of black patients or patients that are non-white, for example, when it comes to things like um, pain relief. Um, right. Again, while I was working at the trauma unit, you know, obviously, if you've been stabbed, it's going to hurt. So you find that a lot of the black patients that have been stabbed, um, there is no rush to give them any pain relief. And then, you know, the same in the the same well. in the labor wards. We had a phone in about this, I think, earlier this year when uh, the statistics came out that said there's just a perception that, that people of color can endure more pain, yeah. which is incredible, really. Yeah. <laughs> I was a junior nurse. I was training. It was my second placement on the medical ward. Right. A nightingale ward. Really hot day. So I'm doing the, the obs round. So taking observation. Anyway, mm. um, I'm black and um, went to a patient doing these obs. And then he said to me, oh, I bet where you come from, it's a lovely lagoon where you can just go and relax. <laughs> lagoon? So I went, yeah, lagoon. Yeah, lagoon. <laughs> and I said, no. Nah. I don't think there's anywhere like that in Luton. <laughs> right? Yeah. And he was stumped. Absolutely stumped. Like, oh. I said, what, why do you assume? Because of my skin colour. I mean, listen to the way I speak. Mm. Do I have an accent or something? And he couldn't answer me. And then the second incident was when I'd qualified and I was working on a male orthopaedic ward. So this particular patient um, was on skeletal traction. So basically he's fixed to the bed. Yeah. So... Um, and again, really hot day and everything. And I'd said to him on two occasions, like we used to have the same room so you can get your uniforms altered, anything altered and right. stuff. Yeah. So I said, look, if you've got some relatives that can bring in some shorts, we could get the seams taken out, put Velcro down one side. That way he won't be exposing yeah, himself. And, that's nice. You know, you've got the bed cradle over and, you know, people are visiting. You don't want to see it. No. So anyway, it was the third time I'd, I'd sort of said to him, oh, you know, Mr... Smith say, yeah. um, were you able to get the shorts? And he just went in on me and well, used the N-word and that was it. I just... I the didn't, end, the end, I why? I lost it. When I say I lost it, but yeah. I didn't... I lost it in a very direct way. Yes. I didn't blink and said, if you were in absolute agony yeah. and I'm doing the drug round, do not, do not ask me to help you. Like, Are you allowed I'm to do here. that? Are you allowed to do that? Absolutely, I'm defending myself. Oh, good. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't and, be. And the fact is that um, 
And I told the senior sister on duty, and back in those days, this would have been brushed under the carpet. Maybe it was a different person that yeah. was in charge. Sure. Um, but she actually backed me and said no and spoke to him. You don't and have to... I made it clear. I mean, we used to do drugs around in pairs, so whoever right. was working with me could deal with him and things. But I'm not here to take that. And to be honest, I was very new into my nursing career. Yes. And actually, it surprised me that I did react like that. I mean, now. I'm not taking any of it. No, of course. At all. Of course. You know, yeah, and it's not I... about just racism. It's just, I'm not, ta- I'm not there to take it's such it. such an odd, I, I don't want to sound silly, but shouting abuse at someone in a football stadium is easier to understand than using that word to a nurse who is literally looking after you every day. I can't begin to get inside the mind of either of those people. But, my well, God, it's ten times harder to get inside the mind of the second one. Yeah. Just, it's just beggars. Yeah. But, oh, that's prejudice, that's bigotry. I pick, I pick. ask your opinion on one thing, because they're two very different episodes there. And some people listening, the first example, the fellow who thought that you'd have a lovely lagoon to slip into when you got home, he wasn't trying to hurt you. That, that, that is a racial prejudice that he's displaying, but it wasn't, it wasn't malicious. It was just ignorant, right? Or not, right? Well, the thing is, when you... Sometimes it's not obvious. Yes. In, sorry, and when I say not obvious, it's not words. But, my okay. God, you get that feeling. And yeah, right. even a friend of mine who's white, she said, I will never know what it feels like no, to, to feel I. that... that to, to, to experience racism. She said that. Her son is of mixed heritage, but she said it to me. She said she wouldn't know. But, yeah, I get what you're saying, but... Would you have said that to a white nurse that was Irish or Scottish or, or from... A nice lock. He might, he might have said, you can go home and have a swim in a nice lock. Yeah, or, or, <laughs> or say she was Jamaican, but she was white. I guess it's similar to a lot of the stories that you've heard. Um, yeah. I'm a doctor, and my experience is it's a, it's a bit like pick one, anyone. They'll all be crazy. They'll all be random. They'll all be hurtful, traumatic. Yeah, um, of course. But... Some of the ones that stick out most, I think, was when I was in medical school, actually. So even before I was a doctor, you start feeling these things. Um, and we had just given a lady a cancer diagnosis of the fact that it was, she was terminal. It was quite a somber moment, of course. Yeah. Had to be respectful, very quiet. And the husband of the patient, as they were just leaving after all of the, the news had been delivered, he walked past me and was like, oh, you look familiar. I was like, oh, no, I'm not entirely sure where from. Yeah. He said, oh, do you live here? I said, no, I think it must have been someone else. He was like, chuckled and said, I know, it was quite much. And I just was like, well, I, didn't, I didn't register it. And then the oncology nurse, who's supposed to support a lot of the you know, discussions that go mm. in and provide extra support to the, the family and the patient, she laughed along with him and said, oh, no, 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 it wasn't that one. It was Rip Off Britain. And joking? again, I... No, I, this is legitimately true. I had my colleague there, the consultant was there, and those two, the, the husband and the nurse, chuckled, and then they carried on leaving, and we all said bye. I still continued saying bye and was pleasant and was yeah. fine, not entirely registering what was happening. No, and then cool. after I left, my colleague, who is white, my medical student colleague, who is white, went bright red, and he said, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what to say. I can only apologise on his behalf, and that's when it sunk in. And I was right. like, my goodness, like, how the hell can you get away with saying something like that to someone who is qualifying as a just, and that's just one. And then now I'm a registrar in the hospital, I'm becoming quite senior. And <laughs> it's day to day, every single day, I'll get elderly patients who will outright refuse. And one told me, I'm the reason that this country is going to pot. Don't touch me. I want a white male doctor, please, and thank you. You, you personally were the reason me why the country was going to the Me pot. personally, me, Dr. Sarah. How do you... I, I, you know the question I want to ask you. How, right. how do you get back up again? Initially, yeah. um, initially I just did. It, I love medicine. I love helping. I love what I do. I really you're obviously do very, very tangible. good at it. You're obviously very good I'm at it as well. Trying to be, yeah, yeah, and I think I'm getting there. But more recently, I think it is taking a toll. Yeah. I, I am, I am aware that sometimes at the end of the day, I'm just like, oh, that was a rubbish one. Yeah. And I've got two little kids, and sometimes I come home with that same energy. And now I'm right. like, I don't know that it's worth the impact it's going to have on them. That's where the decision making is. Is this actually, you know, the squeeze worth the juice? Is the juice worth the squeeze? But it's, I don't know. 
I don't know that it entirely is anymore. And so decisions have to be made about, do I continue? Maybe well, I exit? You, you know that the, the speech that Adrian James is giving today at the Royal College of Psychiatrists International Congress is, is addressing retention and recruitment as a mm-hmm. consequence of racism. So you couldn't really be a better example of the problem he's describing, could you? Because it, it it's, it's, it's the chipping away, isn't it? It's, it's, exactly, it's, that's what it is. Each little one takes a little bit more of you and from you. And in the individual one, probably it's not a big deal. You can laugh with it. Sometimes you laugh it off with your, your family when you come home. You'll be like, you won't believe what happened today. Sure. And they're like, it's another one. But the accumulation, the accumulation of it, then you realise actually there's a massive chasm left from all the little things that have been yeah. taken away from me, and that's, that's actually I'm quite sorry. damaging. Yeah. I'm sorry. And, and, and you know, of course you know, and it's glib of me to say so, that the massive majority of the people you've helped and looked after would sure, be hugely, no hugely grateful for it. Yeah. The bit, you know what stuck in my craw the most, Sarah, about your stories was the oncology nurse, actually. That was the one that got me. And yeah. it's one thing when the patients do it, or it comes from someone who maybe you can excuse it because they've got dementia, like the last caller said, or because they're yeah. unwell. But what's the excuse for colleagues? I, that's where it kind of becomes a bit mm. and from the end what are they thinking the rest of the time what are they doing the rest of the time when they're not articulating the, and yeah. sometimes they do it's not, it's not the only time I've had it articulated from a colleague sure. a professional member so it comes from both angles constantly all the time morning night it, it, it just there's never a time where you're not experiencing some form of this some form of prejudice and, yeah. and, and aggression. Well, I, I, I mean, what can I say? Thank you for everything that you do and, and have done, and I, and I hope it, I hope it gets better.